the new bear in town. Sleepy Southborough, Massachusetts has a frisky new resident whose appearance about town is entirely without precedent. A 200 pound black bear, merely no more than a cub, has been roaming through town, causing quite a hubbub. At first, the cub raided bird feeders because he needed something to eat. Then he realized that feasting at supermarkets could not be beat. So, early in the morning, the bear decided to park it near a store's food loading platform, giving new meaning to the term bear market. <laughs> store workers called the local police who came over to catch the bear. But when they arrived at the market, the wily bear cub wasn't there. The cop should have stayed at the station because that's where the bear soon was, staring through the window at the dispatcher, <laughs> seeming happy he had fooled the fuzz. <laughs> the police and the animal control officer finally got to observe the bear, which they deemed quite safe to people, though a threat to bird feeder fare. Townsfolk enjoyed seeing the bear loping through the neighborhoods. They started calling him Blackie and looked for him when they could. Folks in town just love Blackie, naming him the official town bear. Some say when he grows older, he might even make a good mayor. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bathing in quiet thought, a whisper of memory, the tick of a clock, the house speaks, quietness like eternity, captures my attention. In restful calm, be still my aching heart, gather time for yourself and be one in spirit. Is it I to disallow change? The tick, a moment's passing. To allow the heart to speak, careful and caring I sus suspect. To whom I suppose? Be still and listen, be kind and allow, be true and tall, be sure and gather, and allow this time to pass. Thanks. Bubble message. Bubbles big, bubbles small, single are in double balls. With golden flecks or rainbow hues, bubbles silently show various hues. Each struck by rays of light project a different delight. No two are just the same. Each in the air on its life's aim. Thus, as you and I breathe air within, we should go in glory and live with them. Most chivalrous fish of the ocean, to ladies forbearing and mild, though his record be dark, is the man-eating shark will eat neither woman nor child. He dines upon seamen and skippers, and tours his hunger assuage, and a fresh cabin boy will inspire him with joy if he's past maturity age. He likes his gristle. A doctor, a lawyer, a preacher, he'll gobble one any fine day. If the ladies, God bless them, he'll only address them politely then go on his way. I can readily cite you an instance where a lovely young lady of Bream, who is tender and sweet and delicious to eat, fell into the bay with a scream. She floundered and flounced in the water, then sink nilled in vain for her bark. Bark, bark. And she'd surely been drowned if she hadn't been found by a chivalrous man-eating shark. He bowed in a, a manner most polished, as thus soothing her impulses wild. Don't be frightened, he said. I've been properly bred. And will eat neither woman nor child. Then he proffered his fin, and she took it. 
Such gallantry some none can dispute, and the passengers cheered as the vessel it neared, and a broadside was fired in salute. They soon, soon stood alongside the vessel, and a life-saving dinghy was lowered with a pick of the crew and her relatives too, and the mate and the skipper aboard. And she hauled up in a jiffy, and the shark stood attention the while. Then he raised on his flipper and ate up the skipper <laughs> and swam away with a smile. This proves that the prince of the ocean, to ladies forbearing and mild, though his record be dark, is the man-eating shark will eat neither woman nor child. I'm actually here to, uh, to talk about a subject that's been kind of dear to my heart for the last year since I, I was had a very successful diet through the Metro West Medical Center. It's called, you know, dieting. And, uh, you know, I've learned that uh, for any food that has less than 20, it has, is, 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 uh, whose calories are reduced by uh, 20 percent is actually diet food. And so uh, I, I now have a new favorite diet. It's the, it's the bagel diet. It's a piece of bread with a hole in the middle that's got 20% fewer calories, right? And so I tried to stretch this to the, uh, to the pizza diet. I cut a hole in the center of a big pizza and felt a little better. And, and then I uh, washed it down with my favorite diet beverage, a large beer, because it came with a bottle with a hole in it, right? Oh, yeah, well, okay, all right, okay. Yeah, you know, so much for diets, but, but uh, back, on, uh, back on the subject of bagels, uh, uh, big issue in Framingham these days is uh, there's a new uh, bagel store about to open called Brooklyn Bagel. Anybody hear of this? You know, it's a, uh, Frambors has even been a, kind of alive talking about this, and I got to thinking, Brooklyn Bagel? In, 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 a, in the Boston area? I mean, I mean, I guess we should be lucky that they didn't call it Yankee Bagel, right? I mean, you know, that would have been even worse. But, uh, I, you know, well, maybe it's timely. Maybe, maybe they're doing in honor of Jackie Robinson. You know, the, uh, you know, the movie 42, which is really wonderful. And uh, I guess their, uh, guess their bagel probably has, uh, you know, just 42 calories in it. Maybe it just costs 42 cents. I believe it takes 42 weeks to digest one, but uh, okay. But uh, you, you know, they do. Uh, the Brooklyn bagels are special. They they claim they're made from special water, but then I got thinking, Brooklyn and water? What is it? The East River? Uh, you know, uh, the New York Harbor? Uh, you know, gee, I, I don't know. But uh, I I guess they do have a lot of competition. Uh, one of one of their you know finagle a bagel. Uh, I've always had a little trouble with that. It sounded a little X-rated to me, but uh, I guess there's some other ones that are kind of getting started. Dunkin', Dunkin Donuts now has bagels, <laughs> you know, but Dunkin' Bagel, I mean, wh what do you dunk one of those things in? Uh, sulfuric acid or something? I don't know. It's, it, those things are like rocks, but uh, oh, oh, what else is there? Uh, the uh, Framing, you know, in Framingham, I would have thought that they might have had a, a Framingham bagel in honor of the Framingham Heart Study you know, guaranteed to give you a heart attack, but, uh, or, um, you know, and, and let me conclude with, with, with a thought about perhaps a, a bagel from Boston that might have been called a Red Sox bagel. You know, I always have to do something with it, really with the Red Sox, but uh, anyway, they, uh, you know, they, they might, uh, the problem with those is they can't sell them in October, right? I mean, yeah, that's for anyway. But uh, you know, the, and and the other problem is 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 that the uh, they were going to have one on uh, on Valentine's Day, but he's not there anymore. So that 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 wasn't going to work. And the last thought on Red Sox bagels is is that if you eat too many of them, yes, you too will become a green monster. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just the other day Pondering life Neat the suds and spray When the sliver of soap Caught my mind Hard to handle Not easy to find Elusive and fragile And easily bent But when it's melded To a fresh new bar It can't continue Till it's work is done 
part of the whole it's sent still lingering the melding of the soap the melding of the soap hey nothing gives an old dog hope like the simple lesson learned from a sliver of soap <laughs> And I thought to myself that life's this way Struggle and strive through all your days And hope that some part of you will remain An idea, an inflection, turn of a phrase Elusive and fragile and easily spent A slight reminder, a hint of our passing To the next generation, now amassing Maybe even influence, it's changing The melding of the soap, the melding of the soap Hey, nothing gives an old dog hope Like the simple lesson learned from a sliver of soap So now I sing these simple songs Hope that someone might sing along And pass some part to the next generation A rhythm, a rhythm, a quaver Some musical flavor Elusive and fragile and easily lent And we'll live on in the songs they are singing In the echoes of tunes that still ring true Long after they're creating The melding of the soap, the melding of the soap Hey, nothing gives an old dog hope Like the simple lesson learned from a sliver of soap The melding of the soap, the melding of the soap Hey, nothing gives an old dog hope Like the simple lesson learned from the melding of the soap there you go. Thank you very much. As I like it. A thing in conversation that like bothers me is like how people use like <laughs> to use the word like in like every sentence. I ask myself, is it like they just like the word? <laughs> Or do they like not know? They say like so often. Don't like get me wrong. I like the word like. But I like to see it like used to liken something. To like some like thing. If we like didn't have the word like to make like a simile, we would like always have to use as. <laughs> and like that would be boring. I mean like boring. I would like the people who like to use like so often to like stop. <laughs> but that's like unlikely. When he ran out of jurors for a trial, an Ohio judge sent sheriff's deputies to the local Walmart to issue summonses to surprised shoppers. I was standing at the checkout counter in the grocery section, my hand extended for change when the deputy slapped the summons into it, grinning like a flat frat boy playing a practical joke. Others were served over watermelons or along with a pound of burger at the deli counter. Twenty of us were led to an old school bus, allowed to put our groceries in our cars, leaving lettuce to wilt in its bag, ice cream to melt into soup. Like criminals, we could make one call. I told my wife to eat lunch without me if she could find anything in the refrigerator. <laughs> The deputies informed us it was a big trial, that if chosen, we might be sequestered. I thought of bananas rotting in my trunk. 
The judge was a bilious old man with pastry crumbs down the front of his robe. He whipped the lawyers with his sharp voice until they chose enough shoppers to fill out the jury. And then it was over for those of us not chosen. Dropped back at the Walmart lot, it was as if we'd stepped outside for a long cigarette break. We could have continued shopping all night if we'd wanted to. But who knew where we might end up if we dawdled at the dairy case or took too long to grind our coffee? Thank you. You would be calling me out of the cold water today, telling me to buy a new car, as you did 15 years ago, before I bought this one when I dodged and dove under for the sake of nostalgia, resisting you thoroughly, praising that first car, its grill, its set of tires, the stories it tells. And now it would be this set of tires and the snows and all that money I put in to set it right. I would be telling you it only has 235,000. I'm planning on 300. I still regret not having changed the timing gear in the Chevelle, and I don't have time to look for a new car or the know-how. You would parry with side airbags and anti-lock brakes. But what could I do when I was already there making nice with the mechanic. And you would lament, upset that my face is cut, my eye bruised, my legs, my palm, and you would introduce me, this is my daughter, she fell off her bike, and the subtext reads, she doesn't usually look like this, I'm embarrassed, forgive her and not buying in to the anti-inflammatory powers of a cold pond, you insist I would get sick. I won't be saying I can't let go of the Honda because you helped me buy it, and you're not here anymore, you star of the showroom who knows how to say no to walk away from what you don't want. You've learned the only way to triumph is to grab me by the hand and take me to the dealers. But my fuel lines are cracked, leaks in the power steering rack. The ground cable is frayed. I'm set to pay, and I can't call you, and no one will take my hand. In 1986, the Boston Red Sox lost the World Series in particularly excruciating fashion, and even for the Red Sox. The most memorable play of that series was a ground ball that went through the legs of a Red Sox first baseman named Bill Buckner. The Walk of Life. You weren't here that long, and near the end of a career that wasn't quite Hall of Fame. We knew you through the box scores and the car radio. And I remember, as that fateful season neared its end, almost hearing tears in the announcer's voice as he tried to describe the sight of you careening around second on your two terribly damaged legs, stretching a double into a triple. And gallant was the word he used, and gallant is how I remember you. But we live in a time where Nike erects a billboard in sight of the Olympic athletes. You don't win silver, you lose gold. And so it is that some remember only the nightmare 10th inning of game six, the big bouncing grounder that found its way between those two gallant legs, condemning you to the underworld of those who made it within a whisper of the top, who beat all the competition except one. The inmost circle of that underworld's reserved for the Fred Merkels, 
the Roy Regalises, the Denny Gale Houses, and the Mike Dukakises. For those second place finishers destined to be remembered, particularly for their hamartia, that one error in judgment, the base untouched, the photo op in the tank. Oh, Billy Buck, why did it happen to happen to you? I once saw a music video that began with a long string of clips of athletes looking foolish. Stone-fingered tight end juggles ball five times before linebacker demolishes him and ball drops harmless out of bounds. Runner trips over second base as though surprised that it was there. Tall Caucasian butchers slam dunk and comes away bleeding. And then suddenly, it changes. The wide receiver soars in the end zone, gets one hand on the ball, and it sticks. And he cradles it to his belly, surrendering his body to the furious crash of the cornerback he just burned. In a moment of such violent airborne beauty that such conspicuous gallantry that you thank God videotape exists. And you pray that long after we've destroyed ourselves, Alien will land and find this tape. and wonder at the mad grace of such a race. And the soundtrack sings, you do the walk. You do the walk of life. I was surrounded by children when I saw that video. My daughters, their cousins, and the like. Suddenly filled with a spirit, I stood up and began to preach the brilliance of what we were watching. That if you want to achieve anything spectacular in life, you have to risk humiliation. And this one time, they all listened to me, fascinated like pigeons in a CC. <laughs> and I can tell you, standing stiff and tall, the ball bouncing toward you, big and slow, and I know you're thinking, thank God, at least we're out of the inning, and then it's a little too slow, and the batter is terrible down the line towards you faster than anyone named Mookie has a right to move. And so you reach deep into the gallant center of your soul and you will the ball to get there a little quicker because now it has to. And there's one tired instant in there when you believe that you can do this, that you can will the ball there, that it's believing in yourself too much. I guess what bothers me most is our dishonesty. We know this happens to a thousand people one way or another every hour of every day. But we can't live with that knowledge. So we joke, we say, <laughs> like Bill Buckner, huh? Fostering the pretense that we're too good for this to happen to us when what is spectacularly obvious is that we're not even close enough to being good enough ever to be exposed to anything this bad. Our errors go unnoticed because we unnotice, and we like it that way. If we were honest, your name would be spoken only after the lights were out, and then only between two people who had achieved the deepest intimacy, who knew that they could turn to one another in the darkness when the fear was upon them, one of them might gently brush the shoulder of the other, swim up from the depths of sleep and whisper, what is it, my darling? And the other might sigh, build them, Buckner. And the other might caress the other and whisper, shh. It's all right. Sleep will come when you're not looking. Morning will come and breakfast. And things that should be easy will be easy once more. It is the walk of life. You've walked it before. You will walk it again. Shh, beloved. Shh. Jack McCarthy, thank you. Now I'm approaching 85 and wondering why I'm still alive. Advanced years for summer gold, but it's not all fun 
when you are old. There often is some pain or ache. Do not fall, a bone might break. Skin eruptions, various itches, inside organs and counter glitches. Strength, endurance, start to slip. Pep and energy lose their zip. Memory becomes uncertain. Is it time to draw the curtain? <laughs> but wait, there's other, often other ways for having future happy days. Loved ones visit, we reminisce of experiences that gave us bliss. The shows, the music, happy times, the scenic trips, exotic wines. Life is filled with memories to boast of any time you please. Exaggerate what you've achieved, even if you're not believed. Maybe humor is the key to help preserve your sanity. Thank <laughs> you.